and to the tzaddik is in a sense being disrespectful to Hashem. So it takes on a whole different dimension when you think of it that way. So yesterday we went through the Rambam. It's interesting, sometimes people, when you quote the Rambam, they will say to you, well, the Rambam was the Sfardi, and we are Ashkenazim, at least those are Ashkenazim, and therefore we're not bound by the ruling of the Rambam. But the truth is, it's a mistake. Why is it a mistake? The Rambam was really a Sfardi, that's true. But it's not true that we're not bound by the ruling of the Rambam. Not only that, but the Shulchan Aruch, which is the code of Jewish law, which we all follow, the one who wrote it, he wrote it uh, 400 years after the Rambam. Whatever he wrote is based on the Rambam. So if there are places where the Ashkenazic authority disagrees with the Rambam, then we say, okay, so the Rambam's ruling is applies to Sephardic Jews, and the Ashkenazic ruling applies to Ashkenazic Jews. But if the Rambam gives a ruling, and there's no other ruling that disagrees, then we go by with the Rambam's words. So in this case, we don't have to look too far, because in the Shulchan Aruch, the code of Jewish law, which all Jews follow, it has the same halach. I don't have this in English, but it's, it's underlined. And I'll just read the word slowly, where it says very similar to what it said in the Rambam. And in fact, the origin of this is in Gemara. And I'll soon show you it's in, it's in, um, not all of it is in Rashi and Chumash, part of it is in Rashi and Chumash. Call a chedek al rabbi, whoever argues against his rabbi, k'chedek al ashkina. Again, this is Shulchan Aruch, the code of law. It's like arguing against the shkina. If somebody leads a, a uh, in other words, the first one is if he disagrees, the second one is if he leads an argument, like creating controversy with his Rebbe, it's like, like creating controversy with the Shekhinah. Someone who complains about his Rebbe, it's like complaining about the Shekhinah. Whoever doubts his Rebbe, doubts the integrity of the Rebbe, is like he's doubting the integrity of the Shekhinah. Here, the next page, we have it in English. So this is... Um, this is Rashi. Here in the Chumash, it says, Moshe told Joshua, we're going to fight Amalek. And he used the words, Bechar Lano Anashim, choose for us appropriate people to go fight. When he said, choose for us, who's us? Me and you, Moshe and his students. So it's, it means that Moshe is equating himself with his students. Mikan Omru, this is the source that our sages said, the honor of your student should be as dear to you as your own. And therefore, he put himself and his student on the same, on the same level. And then it continues, and the honor of your friends should be equal to the reverence to your Rebbe. And brings a passage for that, a verse. Then we turn the page to 12b. And over there it says, and the reverence for your Rebbe should be like the reverence of heaven, of Hashem. Shenemar, as it says, is a passage which says, Adoni Moshe Kloim, which means destroy them from the world because those that rebel against you, which is Moshe, deserve to be destroyed as if they had rebelled against Hashem. So the explanation to all these statements are that being that the tzaddik is a person, that he is manifest Hashem's presence, so therefore, when he says something, it means Hashem is speaking through him. He has an opinion. That means it's Hashem's opinion speaking through him. And therefore, by going against him or ridiculing him or anything else along those lines, as if I'm doing it to Hashem.
Another example, this is a, a passage that starts on page 13. On top of, just look at the passage, the one that's underlined. It says, at the top of the page, by Yikrabai and the Almighty, and he called him, Kale of the case of the Almighty is God of Israel. And then in Rashi, there's a discussion of what those words really mean. In Rashi, there's two explanations. One is on this side of the page, on the other side of the page is another explanation. So look at Rashi, Rabbi Sena Darshu, our rabbis, our sages interpreted to mean, Shakodesh Baruch Korol Yaakov Kel. It was Hashem who called Yaakov Kel. Kel is Hashem's name, but that's what it is called Yaakov by that name. Why? You can look at the footnote here, whoever published the Chomish already writes, as if it had been written, the God of Israel called Yaakov Kel. Why? Since God reveals himself upon this world through the tzaddikim, through Yaakov, therefore Yaakov can be called Kel. Which means when we say the word and we refer to Yaakov as Kel, we know what it means. We're not, God forbid, referring to a person in, in, as divine, but it means that we know that Hashem's divine presence manifests in the world through the tzaddik. So, this leads us to another thing. This means that if a person has, is disrespectful towards the tzaddik, in essence, he's being disrespectful towards Hashem. And that's the explanation why people feel that the you know, respect that people show to a Rebbe is a little bit overboard, it's extreme, it's going out of your way. And the answer is yes, because it's not just respect for a person for his knowledge, for his academic achievements, or for his good name, his good character traits. It's really also respect for the presence of Hashem that's within him. Again, this I don't have in Hebrew, in English, so I'm just going to read the Hebrew. This is a Pasuk in B'Shavach, but some of you might say this in the davening, because we say this every day when we read the song that he sang by the splitting of the sea. What does it say? And the Jewish people believed in Hashem. And in Moshe, his servant. So the Medrash asks, if they believed in Moshe, of course they believed in Hashem. Why does it have to say both? They believed in Hashem and Moshe. If they believe in Hashem, certainly they believe in Moshe. So the answer is, this comes to teach you that whoever believes in the shepherd, the faithful shepherd of the Jewish people, this is equivalent to believing in the one that spoke and created the universe. In other words, belief in Moshe is an expression of my belief in Hashem. There's another thing similar to this. It says, by Daber, by the king of Moshe, when the Jewish people rebelled against Moshe, it says they spoke out against Hashem and against Moshe. Again, if it says that he spoke out against Hashem, why does it have to air they spoke out against Moshe? But this comes to teach us, whoever speaks against the faithful shepherd of the Jewish people, it's as if he's speaking against the one that created the universe, which is Hashem. And the same thing applies to what we just, what we learn now in these sources is that the awe and respect to a tzaddik is of the same nature of the awe and respect to Hashem. Not, again, not chas v'shalom associating uh, any kind of divinity to a human being, but because Hashem's, just like I said the other day, we have respect for a shul, we have respect for the Beis Hamikdash, we have awe and respect for Sefer Torah, because Hashem's presence is found within it and manifests in it. And here we say Amunah, that a person who has trust and faith in Moshe Rabbeinu or in any tzaddik, it's an expression of my trust and faith in Hashem. Like, why do I have trust and faith in Moshe? Because he's Hashem's servant. Because Hashem speaks through him. So, for example, when Moshe told the Jews, okay, we're leaving Egypt, we're going to a desert. How are three million people expected to survive in a desert? There's no stores. You can't order things on Amazon. You can't uh, uh, expect to 
to take it off of the fields because it's a desert. There's no field. There's nothing growing there. How do they expect to survive? And the answer is faith. They believed in Moshe, that if he's leading us there, it means Hashem is saying, that's where you need to go. That if Hashem is sending us there, he will provide. How? We don't know. They, they, they didn't know there's going to be a miracle that food will just come down from Shemaim. But they didn't know that Hashem would provide, and they trusted. But Hashem didn't speak to Moshe spoke to them. So the answer is, their faith in Moshe is an expression of their faith in Hashem. And we find the same regarding love for Hashem and love for its tzaddik. So this is all Hebrew, and I'm going to confuse you. I'm going to read it from inside. It's one, two, three, four pages. If you can ask me a question, so why did I put it there? Good question. That's the first answer. The second answer is you've got also once taught this class to students who uh, went to be Srifka and we knew how to read the Hebrew. We went through this whole thing in Hebrew. So I figured, let me leave it there. If anybody wants to look it up and see everything inside from the source, they have it right there. What it says here is an interesting thing. It says like this. There's a very often in the Chumash, you have the word S. If you didn't notice it before, you should have noticed it this Shabbos. Every other word is S. In fact, sometimes it's written S, but sometimes it says S. For example, Shema, Wahavta, S, Hashem Alekecha. What does S mean? What? Wahavta, you should love. It doesn't mean anything. It's got different, like, that this word. What? Like definitely, just the looking. Definitely, it means definitely. Yeah, like just this thing. Like where we're probably. I mean, only this. That's something else. It's a direct object. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a strange word, and in a certain way, it doesn't have a a real translation. But it's all the time. It's always there. Hashem, S, The word S. Start looking around. You'll see how many times it's found. So. Um, there was a, a sage that he said true, and therefore every time that the Torah writes the word S, it's teaching us something. And he went through the entire Torah from beginning to end, took each verse that had the, letter, the word S, and he showed what the word S is adding. He came to one place where it says, you should fear God your God. And it says these words, S Hashem Elokecha Tira. God, your God, you should fear. But it also has the word S. And he couldn't figure out what is the S doing there. And then he said, well, if this is not consistent, that means everything else I said before is also not acceptable. I'm casting my whole approach. I have an approach that every time it says S, it must be teaching something. And here I can't think of anything that is teaching us. So it means that my rule doesn't hold. So I take back everything that I said. And he took back all the teachings that he gave. Later, there was someone else by the name of Rabbi Kiva. And he said, you don't have to do that. That S also teaches us something. So we can put everything back again. What does it teach us? Not only should you fear Hashem, you should fear the tzaddikim. You should fear the Torah scholars, like you fear Hashem. Because we just learned now that fear for a tzaddik and the awe and fear of a tzaddik is the expression of our fear of Hashem. So the word S comes to add, just like you should have awe and fear for Hashem, you should have awe and fear for a tzaddik. So when this Gemara discusses this point, there's another, one of the commentaries bring that it says another passage, which I just mentioned, you should love God your God. We'll have to S Hashem and Akecha. What is S add there? The same thing. Just like you should have love for Hashem, you should love Torah scholars, which means if you love Hashem, then you love those that are attached to Hashem, that are connected to Hashem. And that means that our love for a tzaddik is an expression of our love for Hashem. Our fear in all of a tzaddik is an expression of our fear in all of Hashem. Our faith in the tzaddik is an expression of our faith in, in Hashem, because the tzaddik is just the one that through him, Hashem's presence is revealed to us. So what I meant to accomplish here is number one, to show you the source. And number two, as much as possible to understand 
why we why we say it this way. But this is why you find that by Chassidim, their attitude to the Rebbe is so much stronger because this is something which is discussed much more in Chassidus. In the revealed part of Torah, when we talk about Torah scholars, it's more about their scholarship, their knowledge, their vast knowledge, the depth of their knowledge, their character traits, everything that they do and the way they relate to one another. And that's the way it is on the outside. And this is a deeper inner dimension, how the tzaddik is so much connected to Hashem that Hashem's presence is revealed within the tzaddik. <coughs> Any questions before we go on to the next piece? Yep. Yeah. Um, so when we like go to speak to our Mishpia, we're saying that like, so like we're saying that the Sonic is like guiding us, like it's the guidance, like, like the Shem is guiding us through the Sonic. And like when we speak to our Mishpia, like we're getting like guidance, like through our Mishpia, like from the Rebbe. But like, why is it then like two? Like, why not? So like the guys are getting from, I mean, I guess there's also. So, so let me, let me, let me understand more clearly what part is the question. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I um, thought so. <laughs> <laughs> like, I guess it's just like, when we're getting guided it, to the Rebbe. It's like, why do we need a Meshpia? Why can't we just go straight to the Rebbe? No, I understand. Why we need a Meshpia. People say that when you talk to your Mishpia, you're getting really guidance from the Rebbe, but she's saying, why does it have to be Hashem through the Rebbe, and then like the Rebbe through the Mishpia, why not just Hashem through the Mishpia? Kind of, yeah. So, again, ordinary people that are not Sadiqim, we can't say that Hashem's presence manifests through them because they're not really so pure to say that Hashem could manifest through them. Doesn't mean they're doing terrible things, but a tzaddik is not just that he doesn't do terrible things. A tzaddik is a person that's exceptional in everything. And as a result of that, he is a uh, sort of appropriate vessel that Hashem's presence could manifest through him. So to say that Hashem inspires me whatever I think or feel, that's not true because I'm not on that level that I can get that kind of an inspiration. But tzaddik, yes. Then the Rebbe tells us, go to mashpia. So first of all, the reason why we need a mashpia is because the Rebbe says things in, in a way which is for all of Israel, for all Jews, and then every person has to know how to apply that to themselves. In fact, sometimes the Rebbe could say something, and but the specifics, how it applies, it can apply to one person one way, and another person can apply it totally different, even though it's based on the same principle, the same teaching, because so that's where we need the mashpia who understands what the Rebbe teaches, and he'll help me, being that he's objective, not like myself, that I'm not objective, and guide me. But what we're saying, what you mentioned is that the Rebbe said that when he tells us to go to mashpia, in a sense, he's giving a bracha to the mashpia that he should be able to guide me in the right way. So it's not like I'm putting myself at risk by asking another person for advice, but the Rebbe is giving us a bracha that is sometimes we see it more openly, sometimes not so openly, but it means that the advice that this person is giving who is connected to the Rebbe, because to be connected to Rebbe, you know, it's not like you have to be tzaddik connected to Hashem, which is on a much higher level. So connected to the Rebbe is someone who's dedicated to the Rebbe's the teachings, the Rebbe's actions, the things the Rebbe asked us to do. And through him, the Rebbe would be sending a message to me, inspiring him to say that I am in a place that what comes to my mind is direct inspiration from Hashem, but not on that level. <clears throat> So if you look in Tanya, there's a chapter in Tanya, I think I mentioned it before. It's in the fourth volume of Tanya. And it is uh, in that volume, which is like the letters, it's called Igros Kodesh. And over there, 
uh, rather a Geras HaKodesh. Over there, there's a place where the Alter Rebbe talks about what is the point of a chassid going to the Rebbe. And he says the main point is that through going to the Rebbe, you develop a deeper love for Hashem, a deeper feeling of awe and respect for Hashem, and a deeper faith in Hashem. Because uh, the purpose of the Rebbe is to reinforce our connection to Hashem. And, and through these things, through the love for the Rebbe, through the learning from the Rebbe, through the faith in the Rebbe, that strength is a person's faith and love and, and reverence by Hashem. <clears throat> it still doesn't answer completely, or doesn't help us understand completely the second part. Okay, respect and awe, now we can understand. But why, is our, why are our lives so much connected and revolve around the Rebbe? So one of the ways that we can understand this is by, and that's the next page, page not, not the next page, but the next, the next uh, part is uh, about the Beis Hamikdash. I forgot to take a look what number page is in the booklet, sorry. So now we're going to page 19. Page 19, what? 19. We're going to see sources that we see in the Torah at Tzaddik is equivalent to the Beis Hamikdash, to the temple. And therefore, uh, if we will understand a little bit deeper what is the function of the Beis Hamikdash, we'll also have a better understanding of what is the function of a Tzaddik and how he how he's related to us. What is it about the Beis Hamikdash? On the surface, that's also something that raises a question. The Beis Hamikdash was very much a crucial part of our life to the extent that when people talk about Golas, what do we always say? The Beis Hamikdash was destroyed. In fact, it is interesting. If you stop someone on the street who is religious and you say, do you observe the day of Tisha B'av when we mourn the destruction? You know, and you stop the person on the street and you say, so why do we mourn on this day? What happened? You know what the answer is going to be? The base Middash was destroyed. But besides the base Middash was destroyed, there were more things that happened. There were hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children that were massacred. There were hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that were taken away in chains as slaves, tortured. So why do we just mention that the base Middash was destroyed? In fact, if you have three things on the list, one is that hundreds of thousands of people were murdered. Two, hundreds of thousands of people were taken away as slaves. Three, the big sanctuary was burned to the ground. Which would you put on the top of the list? Which would be a, the second? Which would be the third? I was thinking the top of the list is that people were killed. The second thing, that people were tortured. And the third thing is that a building which is made out of stone is no longer standing. And yet, most of the time, people always talk about the basis of ignorance, as if this is the most important part. So what we're going to explain, once we understand it, we'll see the reason why that's always mentioned is because everything else that happened that's negative is a result of the base of ignorance being destroyed. It's all a result. That's the main thing that causes everything else to happen. So let's understand what's the function of the base of ignorance. Another thing which raised a question, some of you might remember, we spoke about this in the beginning of the year, and that is, if you stop and think about this as reality, it's pretty shocking how much time the Jewish people spent going to the base of English. Now, trying to think this in a very practical way. It says in Gemara that when they went to the base of English, the halach is they shouldn't be going by horse or wagon, but they should be going by foot. By foot. How long does it take to walk from one place in Israel to another place by foot? Depends where you live. The Gemara says that those that lived the furthest took them two weeks to get there. Whoever lived in the furthest part, geographically speaking, in Israel 